such an honor to have you here. Um, honestly, uh, by far the most uh, just requested speaker this semester. It seems like so many of our students are watching your videos. They're logging on to hear what you have to say. Many have been impacted by your books. And so for all of you who keep hounding me about getting Dr. Peterson here, he's finally here. Can we again welcome him to the house? So many of our students have just been impacted by you. Um, over three million books have been sold. I walked into uh, the Barnes and Noble the other day, and uh, you know you're doing well when you've got good product placement in a book right in the front, but you know you're doing really well where they have stacks and stacks of your book behind the cash register just to keep up with the demand. And the young lady that was there uh, started talking to me a little bit, and then this other employee came up and he said, uh, it's been interesting, so many men are buying this book. Typically women uh, are a lot more frequent you know, uh, shoppers at a bookstore these days, but he said this book is just taking over the world. And so why do you think it has, uh, it has just touched uh, a nerve? Why do you think this book has really triggered uh, 12 Rules of Life, uh, you know, just and, and really connected with so many people? Well, I think the fundamental reason, I've, I've sort of learned this in the live lectures that I've been doing, because I've, I've visited about 150 cities with my wife over the last year. It's a lot of cities. and. Um, I've watched the audiences very carefully and listened to them to see what resonates and, and what doesn't. And I think the, the, the basic argument that I've been laying out is that, well, we all have difficult lives, you know, that life is characterized in, in large part by suffering. That there's an inevitable element of suffering in life. I mean, obviously, that's symbolized in Christianity by the crucifixion, uh, which is a very harsh symbol. And, um, and not only is life sorrowful in, in, in part, but it's also touched by malevolence, and malevolence of each of us, and the malevolence of our social creations, our societies, and even in some sense, the kind of blind malevolence of nature. And so it's, 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 it's a demanding occupation to, to exist as a human being. And you need something to sustain yourself through that. It's not optional because the, the price of existence is so high that without that sustaining meaning, it, it, it corrupts you, it, it embitters you. And, and once you're embittered, things go downhill rapidly. You get vengeful and, and you get angry and, and you get destructive and, and there's really no limit to that. And I've been suggesting to people that the sustaining meaning that they can find in their life isn't to be found through happiness, let's say, because happiness doesn't work when you're not happy, when, 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 when things have gone badly for you, for, for, even for accidental reasons. But you can find sustaining meaning in responsibility. And you can take responsibility for yourself. You can do that. And if you take responsibility for yourself, you treat yourself as if you're someone that's worthy of care and, and discipline. And, and, and then that has nothing to do with being soft on yourself or the pursuit of pleasure, any of those things. You can take responsibility for yourself, and that works. And then if you do that properly, you can take responsibility for your family. And then if you do that properly, you can take responsibility for your community, and you can continue to burden yourself voluntarily, let's say, with, with a greater and greater range of existential challenges. And all that that does is make more and more and more of you. And that works as an antidote to the catastrophe of life. And you know, so I, I speak to my audiences seriously and pessimistically in some sense about part of the substructure of existence, the, the, the mortal side, the fragile side. But conclude, I would say, that there's more to you than there is to what faces you. And I believe that to be true. And, and then I'm encouraging people to, to attempt that. And, and I think part of the reason that the book has been 
perhaps particularly popular among men, is because I don't think we do a very good job at the moment of encouraging men. We have this idea that there's something intrinsically oppressive about the patriarchy and about masculinity in general, and I think that's nonsense. I think that strong, honest, truthful, courageous men pursuing noble goals is of great benefit to everyone, yes. male and female alike. Yes. And, and I want that to happen. Many, I, I want that to happen. So Many universities in the United States now are 60% female in the student body. I don't know if it's like that in Canada or not. Oh, yeah, it's the same. It's the same thing. And then that's, and that's changing extraordinarily rapidly at, at the rate the demographic shift is occurring. There won't be a man left in the humanities or the social sciences in 10 years. And, and that's clearly a... It's clearly a failure on the part of the universities to have that happen. It's wonderful to see women entering the sphere of higher education en masse, but, but something is out of balance. And, it's, and since, you know, for better or worse, as men and women were bonded together intractably, we have to ensure that our institutions are set up so that they're of optimal benefit to to everyone, Ever, otherwise everyone pays. Do you think that uh, there's, with, with so much fatherlessness, that uh, that might have been another reason why you're just really seeing so many, not just women, but a lot of men just show up and uh, read your book, come to your events. Um, I, I, I heard you tell a story about uh, a father and son that you met in LA. Oh yeah, that's you a tell good that one. story really quickly. I oh think, yeah, I think, it was such. I also fun. think it, it touches to the point that you really seem to care about the people that your book is affecting at a very personal level. I, by the way, I loved your opening. It's so nice to come to a gathering like this that isn't characterized by a, a like a like a toxic understructure of cynicism. You know, I see that in so many universities, and it's really corrosive, and I, I hate to see it among young people because, well, first of all, you haven't earned your cynicism. That would be the first thing. But second, <laughs> well, second, because it's so corrosive, and it's such a catastrophe to go to institutes of higher learning and see that what's being developed in young people when they're first starting to open themselves up to the world is a cynicism that tells them before they know anything, that life is a terrible catastrophe, human beings are a cancer on the face of the planet, and nothing can be done about it. And it was so lovely to see the opening ceremony here uh, and, and to feel the, the what would you say? I, the, yeah, the warmth and the welcoming and, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the genuine, you, you seem genuinely pleased to be here. And look, there's 12,000 of you coming out to this, and yeah, it's, it's really... We, uh, so we, we so were, congratulations to you, I would say. That, that's that. a real compliment to use a student body. I was at, um, we were at an airport in Virginia yesterday that we're looking at as a model for the, the one we're going to do here at New London, and the, the manager of the airport says every time he comes here, he's just shocked at how students walk up to him ask him if he needs directions, Welcome, so welcoming to him. So give yourselves a hand, I'm proud of you. Tell that story for the moment. And of course that answer made me lose track of the original question, so you'll have to ask me that question again. Um, well, I think, I think actually something that President Falwell said triggered um, a, a video that we might, we were thinking about maybe showing. And I think it's such a black and white comparative uh, of um, what's happening right now in so many institutes of higher learning versus maybe one of the reasons where we're seeing um, an unlikely growth, what other people are seeing, just really uh, decline. Uh, this is a video uh, in 2016 where uh, you came down to meet with some, some students uh, from your university at the University of Toronto. I think it's also a perfect echo of Cambridge last week, disinviting you by calling you close-minded, and the irony of that, that they would be close-minded to hear you out. But this right here is pretty much the same vein, just this idea that uh, 
an institute of higher learning would be afraid to hear someone out, would be afraid to just come and um, listen to new ideas. Uh, let's, let's watch this video and I'd love to get some comments from you about it. sexual politics. It's not my primary concern. What I'm going to talk about is freedom of speech, and I, I want to tell you a few things about freedom of speech, okay, because I've been thinking about this very carefully. I've been thinking about this very carefully over the last two weeks, and it's partly because of the videos that I've made. But also because... So why do you think people are so afraid to just hear someone out? Or why drown out, try to white noise? Maybe a thought that you might disagree with, but certainly you don't need to be disrespectful. Uh, you're such a champion for freedom of speech because you believe there are things to be said that can really affect someone's life in a positive way. Well, one, one of the things that it's necessary to understand is that inside the philosophical confines of the postmodernist movement as it manifests itself in universities currently is that it's very, very important to understand this because otherwise you don't know what you're facing. There is no debate about free speech because for the postmodernists, especially the ones that, that have a, a, a Marxist leaning, there is no such thing as free speech. Because you see, in order for there to be free speech, there have to be sovereign individuals, not mere members of a group. And in the postmodernist world, there are no sovereign individuals. That's a, that's a Judeo-Christian, oppressive, Western, patriarchal, arbitrary presupposition. It's your group identity that's, that's primary and paramount. You don't have ideas and thoughts, you have what you've been socially conditioned to believe. And the exchange of ideas is nothing but a power game that's played between groups of people who are opposing each other for predominance on the world stage. That's it. And so it's not a debate about the value of free speech. That, that, that's a trivial debate in some sense. It's a de debate about whether free speech itself actually constitutes a genuine phenomenon. And, and classically speaking, what we presume is that each of us are sources of information, let's say. It might be our opinions, it might be our knowledge. And that by through, the, through honest discourse, through truth, essentially, we can negotiate an agreement that will be 
if not to our mutual benefit, which would be optimal, at least capable of establishing something approximating peace. And all of that idea, all of those ideas are under, I would say, serious assault by the postmodernist types in the modern universities. And so the reason that I was shut down at that free speech um, uh, uh, protest, let's say, which, by the way, was an open mic event. All those people that were there who were trying to shut me down had the opportunity to speak after, after I spoke. And the noise you heard was a white noise generator, which was far louder than appeared on the, on the video. And the reason that I was speaking forcefully, let's say, or perhaps even somewhat angrily by the end was because not only was the free, the white noise generator my name is David Limbaushu. I'm unwell. I need help. I need help. I just wanted to meet you. I'm unwell. I call my I hope that you up there. I want to be well. find the help that you need. I want to know him better. got exams from professors like Gary Habermas here um, to face, and we, uh, we just have to remember that, David. You know, we're older, we're set in, set in life, and these guys are just coming up, and, and, yeah. um, and, and so you guys will all be in our prayers, too. Let me, let me tell you something. I think what you just saw is where a lot of you are, but David's just honest enough to cry for help. And some of you are at, are, are at a place, and this is, I think, why your book has connected with people. You're at a place where you're just looking for answers. No one ever taught you basic principles of life, basic survival skills. No one ever told you to make your bed or to show up and, and, and listen and learn. And, and then the dam breaks. And in those moments, I'd rather you be here in this context and in this community, because I can tell you from our community group leaders to our RAs to our RSs and to every student here, that we think God has you here for more than just an education, but for community. And hold on, don't clap, hold on. I, I don't want us to alleviate what God's saying in this moment. And I'll be the first to tell you in front of our distinguished guests that these rules work, but all of them stop short without the ruler, without Christ in your life. And, and, and we are here for that. We're here for you. I'm so glad that happened, because <laughs> I think it just elevates. David. Pardon me? It was a little hard on David. No, not at all. Um, why, do you think, why do you think men like that, and so many of us, are just crying out for help finally? Obviously, you just see this visible manifestation, like that's not conjured up, that's real. Why do you think that? M well, it's so obvious why people are in, like, for me as a clinical psychologist, I've always looked at things, I think, in some ways from the opposite perspective of most, and maybe even most psychologists. I, it's never been a mystery to me why people are depressed. Mm. It's never been a mystery to me why people are anxious and unsettled. It seems obvious why they're 
concerned and, and hurt and anxious and unsettled. I, I think the mystery is how it is that we can conduct ourselves so that that can remain under control. I mean, people deal with very heavy burdens in their life. You know, you, you don't have to talk to someone for very long. Someone you might, might be thinking is doing quite well in the world, and, and, and sometimes people are. But you don't have to scratch very deep beneath the surface before you find out that they have a family member who has a serious illness, or someone who is suffering through an economic crisis of one form or another, or, or who, there's some source of genuine tragedy one degree removed from them, if it's even removed. And most people, even as individuals, have at least one serious problem that they're dealing with. And so it's no mystery that people find it difficult to orient themselves in the world. And the mystery is, well, what can you do about it? And we do know what you can do about it. And, and you know, Jonathan Haidt wrote a book recently, um, uh, no, I'm afraid that it's, uh, the name of the book has escaped me. It's about the college situation and, and the snowflake culture. And um, one of the things that he pointed out, along with Luginoff, who's his co-author, was that if you're a psychotherapist of any sort, particularly a behavior therapist, what you help people do is to identify their problems. That's the first thing, is to yeah. confront what's there, the, the reality of what's there, in, 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 as bluntly as possible. And so you often end up, as a psychotherapist, talking to people about their array of problems. As, it's as if they're putting their cards on the table. And, and you sort out their problems. It's like, and no, they often decide that many of the things that are bothering them are not really that important. They can wait, but that there are crucial life challenges that present themselves to them. And they're not just psychological problems, although sometimes they are. They're, they're problems in life, right? Existential problems. And then what you do is you help people break them down into manageable units, let's say, strategically, and confront them voluntarily. You know, and, and there's an echo of that idea. There's an echo of that in, in, in Christian thinking, and the echo for that is to pick up your cross voluntarily, which is that you have, an, you have a, a, an, an unavoidable mortal burden to bear in life. There's no escape from it except to directly confront it and to take it on voluntarily. And what's so fascinating about that, two things, one is that psychotherapists of every stripe understand that this is one of the primary reasons that psychotherapy works. There's no dispute about that among all the different psychotherapeutic schools, is that the confrontation of existential problems, voluntary confrontation, is curative. And that's really something. And so, and, 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 and the practical aspect of that is quite straightforward. It, 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 it also indicates, practical and philosophical, it also indicates to you that there's far more to you than you think, because it turns out that you have substantial problems, genuine, deep problems of malevolence and suffering, but that if you decide that you will take that on as your responsibility, that you can put yourself together psychologically, just the courage, and you can actually solve the problems. And, 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 and that seems to be true. It's, 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 it's not a naive wish. It, it seems to be well within our capacity. And I mean, that's part of the message, I would say, of 12 Rules for Life, is that dark as things are, there's more light in you than you know what to do with, and there's more light in you than you can possibly manifest. And, and, the, and the way to find that out is to, to challenge yourself against these massive problems and to find out that you're the one that can deal with them. So that's a great thing to know. And so maybe the context isn't the most preferred, but you just, you have someone who just initiates the conversation and crying out for help. And uh, you're, you know, this is what you do. You're a clinical psychologist. So 
on a very practical, everyday language, you know, for those of us who just, what is a good first step? If someone is sitting here and they're saying, man, I'm not going to jump on stage and cry for help, but I'm, I'm at a place where I'm thinking about ending my life. I, I'm in such a dark season in my life where I feel like the valley is the lotus it's ever been. What is a first step right now that you would say? Well, I, I would say, practical? look, I would say that if you're, if you're seriously suicidal, and you can tell if you are, if you have a plan, like a plan that you've, that you've played out in fantasy multiple times, if you know how you would do it and when and where, and if you fantasize about the aftermath, like if that's a well-developed plan, then you should go talk to someone. You should talk to someone professional. You should let a friend know. You should let a family member know. Like you need to do that. You're at risk. You're in danger under those circumstances. In, in less serious circumstances, I would say, people often ask me if I pray, which is an annoying question as far as I'm concerned, but they still ask me that. And I, I've suggested a form of prayer, which I would say I do engage in, and that is to, practically speaking, to do something like sit on the edge of my bed or on the edge of a chair and to think, there's probably something that I'm doing wrong or not doing well enough that I'm being blind to, that I could fix and that I would fix. You know, you, know, you need both of those, right? Because there's lots of things about your life that you know aren't right that you could fix, but you won't. Who knows why? You don't have the discipline or the vision or the courage or... or or, or the integrity of character, or the maturity, or God only knows the reasons. But there are some things that you're doing wrong or not doing that you could fix, that you would fix. And you have to sit and, and, and ask. And, and I think it's, it's, it's the reflection of the New Testament idea that if you knock, the door will open, you know, and if you ask, you will receive. It's a very interesting line because it, 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 it sounds like something that's naively optimistic. It sounds like it's representing God as, you know, the grantor of wishes in some sense. But I don't believe that's what it means at all. I, th I think what it means is that if you actually want to know something, and you actually want to devote yourself to something, if you're willing to make the proper sacrifices, right, and reorient yourself, that you can move towards what you're aiming at. And I, I can tell you that if you ask yourself in all humility how it is that you could be better and what you could do in a small way to move in that direction, that first of all, you will receive an answer about what you're doing wrong, it's not that much different than thinking. We don't regard that as particularly miraculous. Like, you could ask yourself a question and come up with an answer, but if you ask yourself a question about how it is that you're lesser than you could be and what you could do about that, you'll find out. And then if you do that, then you won't be lesser, and that works. And it especially works. It, it, it's a nice form of humility as well, because what you're going to find out if you ask that question is it's not going to be something you're proud of. It's going to be some little rotten element of your character that you're ashamed of in 15 different ways, and, and for good reason. And, it's, it's, and even the attempt to triumph over it isn't going to be something that you're going to be able to trumpet proudly to your friends and your family, because, you know, to fight off something that's shameful is a private affair in some sense, but you can do it. And if you can improve your life incrementally in that manner, if you have the humility, one of the things Carl Jung, the famous psychoanalyst, said about modern people, which I loved, was that modern people can't see God because they won't look low enough. And a lot of that lowness is internal. It's like, well, what's not good enough about me? And the other thing that's so lovely about that is you're not going to do anyone any harm. You know, if you find out something that you're 
lacking. If you discover something you're lacking, well, first of all, great, you've discovered something you're lacking, and you need that thing you're lacking because life is difficult. It's going to call everything that there is out of you. And so you need that thing that you're lacking, and then you can work on it incrementally and, and humbly, you know, humbly meaning you can work on it in the way that someone as flawed as you could work on it successfully. And then, and then you, and then it works. And then things get better, and as they get better, they tend to get better and better. And so that's very practical and, and very much in keeping with psychotherapeutic practice and wisdom, and, and I would say with ancient wisdom in, ge in general. And so that's a, that's a lovely, that's a lovely what set of, 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 of things to know, in my opinion. Be Becky told me that not to talk much because they're here to hear you, not me today. So, uh, but I am going to ask two questions, Becky, okay? All right. <laughs> Could you tell them about the online course you developed that we discussed in the back that help, helps improve retention at colleges? And, and sure. Because we're thinking about working together on that. If you, yeah, if you yeah. don't mind. Yeah. yeah, well, you know, I realized a number of years ago with my colleagues that, and, and this really come, came as a, a shock to me, talking to my 19-year-old students, 20-year-old students who'd been in the formal education system for, say, 18, 15 years. And what I realized, look, the, it was within a course I was teaching called Maps of Meaning, which was based on the first book that I wrote. Um, and it's a, it's a book about how our existence, our, even our perceptions, our motivations, our emotions are grounded in narrative. They're grounded in stories. Uh, and, and I believe the scientific evidence for that is actually overwhelming, um, as well as the, as the colloquially of it, evidence, so that's to why, speak. That's why Jesus taught in parables. Yeah, so it's the most effective way of teaching. And well, look, you'll go, you'll go, you'll pay money to go see movies. You, to be instructed by stories. It's, it's, it's a very deep part of our character. In any case, I realized that my students hadn't ever really been asked to write their own stories. And, you know, you can write a story about who you've been, and you can write a story about who you are now, but you can also write a story about how you, who you could be. And, you know, they'd had, they had written essays on all sorts of abstract topics and been asked to think to some degree, deeply about those topics, but no one had ever sat them down and said explicitly, okay, look, kid, like, here's the deal. You can have what you want and need, assuming you're taking care of yourself, right? Assuming that you're, you're, you're starting out with the proper attitude towards yourself, which is that you're worthy of care and respect, and, and there's something to you that's valuable, that at least could be developed. You need to give yourself that amount of credit, like, like you would with anyone that you might be willing to attempt to care for and love. And then the next question is, all right, you can have what you want, but you have to specify it. What would you like from your friends three to five years down the road? What would you like your friendship network to look like? What would you like to do what, 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 how would you like your career to, to shape itself? How are you going to take care of your family? Your, your, and, and what about children and a, and a, and a, and a long-term mate, a wife or a husband? Um, what are you going to do with your time outside of work that's useful and engaging and meaningful and productive? How are you going to take care of yourself mentally and physically? And how are you going to withstand temptation so that it doesn't take you down in the particular way that temptation might take you down? And so you're asked to write a few sentences, not to be obsessive about it, but to sketch it out like a bad first draft, you know? And then you're asked to write for 15 minutes. It's like, okay, it's three to five years down the road, and you have what you need and want to, to make your life what it needs to be so that you can be a good person in, in the face of the suffering of life. What does it look like? And then we ask people to do the contrary, which I think is also useful, which is, all right, well, consider for a moment your, the multitude of your faults 
and the direction those faults could pull you in. And everyone knows that. Everyone has a sense of how they would fall apart in their own particular manner, with their own particular weaknesses. It's, it's three to five years down the road, and you've let that part of your character dominate. What particular corner of hell is it that you're now occupying? And so now you have something to aim at. You have a purpose, right? And, and that, that's motivating. People need a purpose in life. It, it, you need a, a purpose neurochemically, because without a purpose, you don't feel any positive motivation or any positive emotion. Like, our positive emotion is linked to our pursuit of valuable goals. That's how our brains are, 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 are set up. And, and so you need that, that positive goal, and also to stop you from being unduly uncertain and, and anxious because nothing is specified enough. And you need something to run away from. And so you can run away from the worst in you. You can escape from the worst in you, and you can move towards the best in you. And, and then we have people write out a strategic plan for the accomplishment of their, of their goals. It's called the Future Authoring Program, by the way. It's available online at a site called selfauthoring.com. And we've, we've tried it with thousands of university students now, and it's had a remarkable effect on their retention. The effect is approximately 25%. We decrease dropout by 25%. And it seems to be most effective for the most disaffected students. So it works better for men, because women are outperforming men academically. And it actually works better for non-Western non ethnic minority men, ha ha having a, a tremendous impact on their likelihood of staying in university and also on their grades. And so we were speaking this morning about the potential utility of, well, of offering that to your, to your online students and in the hope that that would... But, but, but the thing that was so strange to me when I was developing that program, and this was like, it was a miracle, a negative miracle of sorts. It, it just struck me as so palpably surreal that we would spend 15 years educating people and never once sit them down seriously and say, okay, look, you can craft yourself to some degree. You have the capacity to write your destiny, not, not in, its, in its entirety, but at least as a sequence of aims. And having done that, you, you need also to justify it. So for example, one of the things we ask people to do once they've specified a goal is to say, well, okay, imagine you achieved this goal, okay? So why is that good for you? Why is it good for your family? Why is it good for your community? You know, because if you want to be locked in on a goal in a manner that's sufficient to take you through the trials that will occur while you're pursuing this goal, especially if it's a high order goal and it's difficult, then you need an explicit philosophy, a rationale for why this is worth pursuing. It's like, well, here's what it'll do for me in, in, in the sense of the development of my character and my capacity to deal with the world. And here's how it'll strengthen my family. And here's how it will benefit the community. And then having formulated those arguments, you have that, you have that, that, that body of carefully articulated thought that enables you to chase away the doubts that will inevitably accrue as you're attempting to do something difficult. You have to negotiate with yourself and you have to justify what you're doing carefully and philosophically, deeply, so that you have the commitment and the strength of character that enables you to push through times that are difficult. And so, well, so we discovered that that hadn't been done, um, except in, 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 in isolated cases. There were some business people who were working on similar projects. and. Uh, a man at uh, the University of Texas at Austin, uh, James Pennebaker. And the program has been phenomenally successful and thousands of people have now done it online. And so, and uh, I, I could, I'll, I'll close this by saying, if you have any interest in doing this, which I would recommend, it's also okay to do it badly because a good first draft aim for your life is incomparably better than vague, nihilistic hopelessness. 
And, and you're not going to get it right anyways, because what do you know? You know, you're, you're going to pursue your goal avidly for a year or so, especially at your age, and you're going to learn a bunch. And then your trajectory is going to shift, but it doesn't matter because the trick is to get the process of moving forward toward the aim started and then to have the humility to make course changes along the way as you inform yourself. And so it gets the ball rolling. And so it's been very gratifying to have developed that because it seems to have been of great use to many people. How many of you would be interested in taking that course if we made it available? Good number, good number. Yeah. Um, I've asked Dr. Gary Habermas to join us today. He's one of our top scholars on the faculty. He was actually one of my professors here, 1980 to 84. But he, uh, I just, he's, he teaches at Oxford, in, in addition to Liberty, Oxford, Cambridge, Edinburgh. Anything would you like to ask Dr. Peterson about? Uh oh. Ask him. No. Uh, yeah. um, no, I, would, I wasn't prepared for that. But let me, let me do this. One year ago, last Easter, somebody sent me a posting from your one of your postings, and it included an article that I wrote, a really brief one on the resurrection. And you made a comment there. You said, not the article, but the topic. You said, this may be the most important topic I've ever considered. Did, had you been thinking about that for a long time, or, you know, this Easter question, the well, center you know, of Christianity? The, 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 the sticking point, I would say, with the atheist community and the Christian community, let's say, I don't really think is the existence of God. That's a sticking point, and it's not trivial. But I think the true sticking point is the idea of the bodily resurrection of Christ, right? And that's, that's a very rough sticking point because it's, it's key to Christianity, and it flies in the face of standard the standard materialist objective view of the world. And so it's something that I wrestle with continually. And, and I think that's okay. I mean, one of the things I learned, I love this. I did a series of biblical lectures in 2017. And one of the things I learned, and I should have known this before, but I didn't, was that um, the word Israel, the name Israel, means he who wrestles with God. And so that the chosen people, the people of Israel, are people who wrestle with God. And I, I do think that that's, that is the sign of a life that's being lived properly. Because if God is the source of meaning, let's say, among other things, the source of significance, um, the, the source of purpose, and and and. The, the, the place where answers might con conceivably emerge. It is a wrestling, if you're honest, because no one knows enough to be certain of anything in some sense. And what you do as you pursue the adventure of your life, if you do pursue it, is to wrestle with those questions of ultimate meaning. And the positive element of the idea that it's those who wrestle that are already the chosen people. Is it's, it's such a lovely idea because it means that despite our doubt, which is inevitable, I believe, the fact that we're willing to contend with that doubt and to move forward in our lives already puts us on the right track. And so that's a lovely thing. Well, with the resurrection, it's, 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 it's an issue that, that, that I wrestle with continually because there's so much in the New Testament that is profound beyond comprehension. I mean, you see this in, Bibli in the biblical writings in general, like the story of Cain and Abel, for example, is 10 sentences. It's some fragment of a story. It's, it's not even a full paragraph, and it's infinitely deep. You, you could study that story and, and analyze it for your entire life and never get to the bottom of it. It's a real miracle that a story like that can exist. And there are statements in the New Testament that are like that. They're so surprising. You see that in the Sermon on the Mount in particular, but not only there, that are so surprising that it's almost impossible to understand how they could have come about from, from, a, from the standard 
scientific materialist perspective say. Um, but the claim is so overwhelming and also so mysterious that I don't know what to make of it. I, I don't know what to make of the idea of the physical resurrection. It, it, it's even, it's, it's complicated conceptually right within the confines of the Gospels themselves. I don't know what it means metaphysically. I, I understand what it means symbolically, and, and that's usually the approach I take, take, given that I'm a psychologist. I mean, I do believe that the part of the human being that leads us to redemption is the part of us that dies when it's in error and is reborn as something better and new. And I, I think that's true practically and scientifically and metaphysically. It's true at a, every level of existence. But I also don't know what it would mean to live that way fully. You know, if you were fully awake to your errors and fully taking advantage of every opportunity that was put before you and fully devoted to the good, to the highest good that you could conceptualize, I have no idea what the limit of transformation might be for a, for a human being because we're very mysterious creatures in a very mysterious world. At lunch, he'll get you, get you clear on the resurrection. <laughs> All right. Okay. All right. Um, one fun question. I noticed, <laughs> I noticed that you, you, you've done some extreme activities. One, you, you sailed around Alcatraz in a cardboard box or something? What, 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 no, it was a racing sailboat, okay, so, okay. which was slightly better than a cardboard box. Yeah, so that was, that, that was a great day. Was that was a great day. You climbed a mountain or what, what was it? I went to an um, uh, asteroid crater with a bunch of astronauts, okay. so that was interesting. And, mm -hmm. Um, I have a brother-in-law who works for Intel, who's an absolute dangerous genius, who has a carbon fiber stunt plane, mm. which is a remarkable device, and we did a lot of aerobatics in that, including something called a hammerhead roll, which, so when you do a hammerhead roll in a plane, you, you, you aim the plane directly upward. Yeah and eventually it will stall, unless it's a rocket, and it's not, it's a prop plane. Eventually it will stall, and when it stalls, it falls backwards. And so in a hammerhead roll, you drive, you fly upward until the plane stalls, and it falls backwards and levels out, and then dives straight down. And so that's... When I was reading your bio, I said... Exciting. I was, good. <laughs> <laughs> When I read your bio and I got to that part, I said, good, we do have something in common. That's, no, but I, I, uh, I wake surfed on the James River a few years ago with no rope behind a boat, and I um, learned how to snowboard just recently, and I um, learned how to wakeboard a few years ago. That's, that's a big thing for somebody my age. But, um, and, the, and the swim and dive team got me to jump off the 33-foot diving platform when it, when it opened a few months ago. That's but, impressive. Yeah, I don't so know if I could do that. I had a whole crowd screaming, so I had no okay, choice. Okay, okay. So it was either, it was either coward or, <laughs> or, or hero. Right. Yeah. And I'm scared to death of heights. So anyway. All right, David, I'm sorry. Becky's going to be mad at me. That's fine. Hey, um, the, young, the, young man, the young man's name is David. And... Um, he, he's not a Liberty student. He's his friends with uh, a Liberty student who graciously has begun to see that uh, there are things in his life where he needs, he's crying out for help. Um, and so David uh, came to a Bible study yes, last night with a friend of his, and then his friend invited him to come hear you, Dr. Peterson. And I just want to make sure we don't lose what God, I think God predestined this moment for us. And I want to, I want to just oh, ask Oh, God, you, he's a tricky character, you know. He does. He does. <laughs> he does put things on that are on skip. I want to make sure we don't miss this moment. Dr. Peterson, we can give David your 12 books, 12 rules in that book. We can give him your next book, which is 12 more rules. And he can, they will be helpful to him. I, I gave your book to my daughter. They will be helpful to her. I read the books, I see Bible verses attached around them. But without David submitting, bending his knee to Christ, 
and just saying, I don't want to clean up the behavior or deal with the symptoms. What's broken in me is my heart doesn't belong to the Savior who's sitting on the throne. How does your book go beyond behavioral modification and walk into soul transformation? Uh, you you got to get on a plane here in a minute and go back to Toronto. But David, so he's crying out for help. He needs someone who's omnipresent. And so, can you just help us understand what does David do once he's done with the last page of, of your book and he begins to apply these things? Because I know a lot of cleaned up people that are just as messed up as he is. I'm that way sometimes. So what? Can you tell me, how does Christ not just become a perfect model and behavior police, but how does He become who He says He is when He claims to be God in David's life? Well, this, we, we talked about this a little bit last night about the idea that, and, and I wouldn't say that my ideas are fully formulated about this. Like, there, one of the things that Carl Jung pointed out was that when you matured, you needed to replace your father with the father, right? Because otherwise your father stayed the father. And and that wasn't good because there's a confusion there between the individual, your father, who of course you have respect for, perhaps, depending of course on your father, but hopefully, and the transcendent idea of the father itself. If you're trying to put yourself together, there's the, the concept of yourself put together, but then there's the transcendent idea of being put together itself. And the idea of Christ, at least, and I'm speaking to you as a psychologist, and I try to limit myself to that, is that that's the embodiment, the symbolic embodiment, at minimum, of the idea of the human ideal. It's, it's what, it's, 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 it's the highest ideal that we can conceive of. You know, if you go into an, an, an old cathedral and you look at the dome of the cathedral and that's the sky, that's the cosmos, and you see Christ portrayed on the ceiling as Pantocrator, as creator of the world, the idea there is something like It's something like consciousness and soul participates in the ongoing co-generation of creation. And that your goal as a human being is to participate in that creation in the in the most ethical manner possible. So imagine it this way. We can think about this very practically. So you wake up in the morning, your consciousness re-emerges on on the stage of existence. And what you're confronted by is the potential of the day. This is something that's referred to in in the Sermon on the Mount, to to concentrate on the day. But so we'll use the day as our unit of analysis. You you see the day as a a set of possible pathways. You could do this, you could do that, you could not do this, you could not do that. And, and, And your conscience speaks to you too, almost immediately, I would say, upon awakening. Here's something I need to do today to keep things in order. Here's something I need not to do today to keep things in order. Here's my my set of obligations that I need to undertake so that when I go to sleep tonight, I can sleep with a clear conscience and things are better than they might have otherwise been. And so what you see in front of you is the potential of the world. And to me, you see, that's akin to the potential that God confronted in Genesis at the beginning of time. That's the meaning of that story, is that there's a potential that, that, that is confronted by an attitude. And the attitude that is appropriate in relationship to that confrontation is the attitude of the Logos. And the Logos is something like courage. That, that, that's one of its primary attributes, and truth. That's the other. Now, there's more, but, but I would say if you had to boil it down to two, it would be courage and truth. And so there's this notion. See, what happens in Genesis is God employs the Logos to generate order out of potential. And every time he does that, he says, and it was good. And the idea there is that if you confront the potential that's in front of you, 
with truth and courage that what you do is you take what could be and you transform it into what is. And you do that and you transform it into what is that's good. And, and you have that, that is you, that's, that's, that's your soul. That's the thing that, as Genesis points out, that, that gives you that affinity with God. The, the, the fact that you're made in the image of God is the fact that you have that capability and that, that that capability to take that potential and to make the world out of it is also dependent on your ethical choices. And everyone knows that, right? Even if we can't articulate it, you know, you know perfectly well that you can wake up in a miserable mood, bitter and, and, and unhappy, and do f 25 things that day to make your life more like hell than it was, and to share that delight with the people around you. Everyone understands that. And you know as well that you can, you can decide to face things courageously and truthfully, and you can make tomorrow's morning somewhat better than today's morning was by, by setting the world in, in order. And, 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 and then the answer to your question is that, you see, you, you can't be doing that because you want to be a good person in some sense. And you can't be doing that because you want to be seen as being a good person. That's not the right attitude. You have to be doing it because it's the transcendently right thing to do. It's the thing that you do if you aim at the highest possible ideal. And, you know, and then that is laid out in the Sermon on the Mount, is that you should aim at the highest possible ideal. You should aim at a relationship with God. And then that you should concentrate on the day. And it's, it's a deadly serious psycholo psychological, it's deadly serious psychological advice. Aim high, lift your eyes above the horizon, right? L lift your eyes to the stars that beckon above. Try to set things right and to orient your life. And, and the, there has to be a relationship with the transcendent that allows you to do that po properly, or it becomes an exercise in ego, and then it doesn't work. Mm. So. Well, I, I can say I've learned a lot today, and I, you, with the number of followers you have, you've, you've really struck a nerve in people, and you found something that they really need. And you must have gotten that way by being a good listener. That's something I'm not. Becky says, whenever she's upset, there's a problem, I'm just a fixer. I just go fix it. You know, she, no, I just want you to listen. So I, I, have, I, have so <laughs> I have something to say about that, very briefly, if I might. Well. If, if, someone, if someone comes to you with a problem, and, and this is, I think, something that men actually have to learn more than women, um, is that the person that's coming to you with the problem doesn't exactly know what the problem is. And the problem with jumping in with a fix too soon is that it's possible that you're, you're curing the wrong illness. And so you have to listen because the person has to stumble around foolishly and in pain to, to let you know what the problem actually is. And, and that's difficult, right? Well, so, you're going to have to teach me more because I'm task oriented. I'm just always going 100 miles an hour. I'll work on it. All right, go ahead, Dave. All right. Um, I just want to tell you because I, I, I genuinely think you have one of the most, you're one of the most tender hearted guests that we've seen. I watched the way you were with your mom last night and this morning. There's, a, there's such a, a compassionate soul in there. And I, I just want to tell you, sir, that um, no matter how much David or David who jumped on stage or David who's sitting here with you, no matter how much we, I believe, self-diagnose and begin to take steps forward, we can certainly fix the circumstances and take forward. But ultimately, without Christ, in the center of our life, uh, I just believe that we, we lose our way. At very best, we just become a really good performaholic. And I'm, I'm, I'm more concerned about the man that David can be when he's a man of God, and the marriage he'll have, and the fatherhood he'll have, and the person that he'll help one day who's crying out for help. And, and, um, and it's such a great opportunity to, to read and to learn these principles, but to know that these principles are ultimately exemplified in the person of Jesus. How can, we, uh, how can we pray for you? What's, what's, we want to close in prayer. Um, 
Is there a prayer request uh, that we can just, uh, we can take away? By the way, have you not absolutely enjoyed and are you not just grateful for him? Thank you, sir. We love you. You're awesome. Amen. How can we, uh, amen. Come on, let's do it. How can I next week pray for you, brother? How can I right now just pray? Stay, stay, stay standing. It's we're gonna, this. It's we're gonna that, pray. That, like my fervent hope, and and perhaps this is something that could be transformed into a prayer, is that the the uh, that the mistakes that I am inevitably going to make mm. while I'm pursuing that I don't pay an undue price for the mistakes that I'm inevitably going to make mm. as I pursue what I'm pursuing. That's my fervent hope, you know, and, and it has been since all of this has broken around me that I would be careful enough in my speech, and that's the logos, you know, yeah. that I would be careful enough in my speech so that I would stay on the right track, on the straight, narrow path, and, 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 and fulfill whatever obligations are my privilege to fulfill. And, and what I hope from the people that are supporting me is that if they wish to pray for me is that I'm careful enough, I remain careful enough and fortunate enough so that my inevitable faults don't interfere too catastrophically with whatever good I might be able to do. So, Amen. Let's pray for our brother. Come on. Put your hands towards him.